All right, quiet on the set. All right, here we go. Stone Roadie number, episode number 28, and action. <laughs> Welcome to the Stone Roadie Show. We have a really good show today, and as you can see, uh, we have Gene Odom, those of you that are familiar with Gene. Uh, he's uh, out in the field uh, at the Panera, is where we had to hook him up in Inverness, Florida, there where he lives. Uh, and and you, Leonard Skinner freaks, don't try to go over there and stock him. Because so, <laughs> he lives out on, on a road that's fish. loaded with mox moccasins. Then we have uh, uh, a, a, another special guest, Kathy Godsey, who's a, a longtime Leonard Skinner fan. And I don't know if anybody saw the, uh, the uh, excerpt that I put on Facebook, and it was talking about the uh, story how Kathy met uh alan collins through gene and she actually and i and i think i said it was off the uh, first album but she got the phone number off the realty sign off of nothing fancy and called the uh leonard skinner the realtor the, the namesake for the band and was actually able to get a hold of uh of gene odom through uh through uh leonard skinner and met her guitar idol and band idol alan collins and and uh, and then uh, Jean took her to Alan's house, which was a really cool experience for her. So uh, welcome, Kathy, and thanks for coming, yeah. Jean. And of course, we got Craig on here, the uh, the world's most famous roadie and uh, the most stoned roadie in the world. And I think we can all agree. I'll second that. <laughs> you agree with that, Jean? Jean, what's I going on? How you how you been? You just got back from a trip. <clears throat> Yeah, I went up to New York, a, a, a friend, Skinner friend, uh, brought me up there to go see the Yankees play and spend a couple of days up there in New York, New Jersey. Ever since when the Yankees in my life. And that just happens to be where Kathy's from, New Jersey. So she's a Yankee. What do you think about yeah. that, Kathy? <laughs> Did you, do, do you... Uh, Got a couple of Yankees on here, huh? <laughs> me and Kathy oh. are both Yankees. <laughs> Well, yeah. Kathy, you just got back from vacation as well, too. Didn't you go out to see your daughter, daughter out in Colorado or something? Yes, yeah, so I flew out to Colorado last Wednesday, and I just got in at 5 a.m. this morning. Well, we and, appreciate you coming on. And, uh, oh, yeah. Just up so in your happy. territory. If you'd have been home, you probably could have met Gene up there where you lived. I said to him, please look me up next time you're out here. I'll buy you a nice lunch or dinner. I owe it to you, Gene. I appreciate that. I wanna, I'm gonna get back up there for too long. I like, I liked it, and the guy, he was, um, he was cool, and he's got an apartment right on 46 and right there in Midtown. Oh, nice. In a little bar right there, and I was sitting at that bar drinking a Coca Cola, and my God, I had no idea. Ooh, talking about rainbow. That's a, <laughs> that's a rainbow paradise up there. Ooh. <laughs> well, Kathy, let's uh, get started with your your story because it's pretty interesting. Uh, and I know I, I talked to you, uh, I think it was on Facebook, like about three years ago. And I noticed the picture that you posted. It was a picture of Gene with his kids and Alan with uh, his kids. Am I correct about that? With uh, his daughter, Allison. Yeah. And you took the picture, right? Y yes, I did. And that was at, uh, at, at Alan's house. So yeah. how, long, how long were you a Leonard Skinner fan? I was a Leonard Skinner fan right before the crash, unfortunately. I didn't really start listening to them until right before the crash. So it's unfortunate that, that I missed out on their their you know early albums. But once I started listening to them, I was just hooked. And I love, I just love the music, the songs, the way Alan and Gary play. But I was just instantly hooked on Alan, his yep. style, the way he plays, everything, everything about him. I just was. You know, I was only 17 years old. And then and what's, 18, that, but... uh, what's that theory you have about when you want to make something happen? Because... Well, well, I was very, very determined. I, I was determined that I was going to meet Alan Collins. But I had said that, you know, I've always believed in the six degrees of separation, which is the idea that anyone in the universe is six or fewer contacts away. You can really meet anybody through six or fewer contacts. So, so, you know, being that I was determined to meet Alan, I, one day I was looking at the 
the nothing fancy nothing fancy album and on the back of the album there was a sign that said leonard skinner realty with a phone number so i called the phone number and i said hi can i talk to leonard skinner and the secretary said well he's not here now and i said well can i have the address so she gave me the address of his office and i wrote him a letter and i said i love the band do you have any of the addresses of the band members and he wrote me back a very nice letter, which I still have. And he sent me a nice T-shirt from a um, some concert he was promoting. And he sent me a nice letter and he said, I don't have the band members' uh, names and addresses, but I do have the um, Gene Odom's address. He's one of their roadies. So immediately, I, I wrote a letter to Gene Odom. And I said, you know, I want to meet the band. I want to meet Alan Collins. And he wrote back to me. And... Um, he said, you know, anytime you're in Jacksonville, look me up. So that was in 1979. In May of 1980, my friend Carolyn and I decided to take a trip down to Daytona Beach. And first thing I said was, you know, we're going to Jacksonville. So we rented a car. We drove up to Jacksonville. The first thing we did was we actually went to see Ronnie's grave and Steve's grave mm -hmm. at, the, at the cemetery. Then we went to the real estate agent at the agency and we met Leonard Skinner. He was there. He came out. He took some pictures with us. He was very, very nice. And then the next thing we did was head on over to Gene's house. We actually went to your house, Gene. We knocked on the door. You weren't there. So, so then we went to a phone booth and we called you and then you answered and you met, you met us with your daughters at a little ice cream shop and you bought us ice cream and then you took us back to your home. And then you picked up the phone and you called Alan. You put him on the phone with me. And I was just, <laughs> I think you said something like, you know, you remember that girl from New Jersey, that big fan of yours? Well, here you go. And I just thought I was going to faint. I don't know what I said to him. It was probably something silly, but he was, he said hi to me and I talked to him a little bit. And then shortly thereafter, you put us in the car and you said, I need to go to Alan's house. Do you want to take a ride? And I said, oh my God. So we drove there and I remember exactly how you drove. I remember the streets. I mean, I was just nuts. I was just nuts and fat during the call. I remember exactly how we got there. As we drove up to his house, you pulled up into his, his uh, driveway and his car wasn't there. And you said, oh, I don't think he's home. So we waited a couple of minutes and then you turned around to head back. And I was so upset. I thought, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> this is not going to happen. But as we were heading back down his street, Julington Creek Road, all of a sudden this car just went flying by. I don't know how fast it was going, 60, 70 miles an hour, something crazy. It was a big Toronado burgundy color. And I saw this hair flying out of the window and he said, there he goes. And I said, turn around. So you did, you turned around, pulled back into his driver. He was there. I think you uh, said that he had picked up his daughter from dancing school or something. So as we were walking up the driveway, my friend Carolyn said to me, Kathy, take it easy. Just don't, <laughs> just be okay. <laughs> so we walked up the driveway and then the next thing I know, we're walking into his den and he was standing right in front of me. And I mean, I just, I couldn't believe it. I, he was right in front of me. I mean, I couldn't believe it. He was, he was tall and thin and he was wearing, he had no shoes and these jeans. And I think he shook my hand and I don't know how long we were there after that. I know that his daughter, um, Allison, came in. She was crying. I think she cut her finger. So I took her in the bathroom, put a bandage on it. Kathy was there, his wife. Uh, Amy was there. Amy was playing with Jean's kids. Jean, your kids were just playing, running around with their kids. And um, we were talking. And what was somebody had asked a question about what was so memorable about that meeting. Well, I remember. Alan showing us his arm. He lifted up his left arm and I couldn't believe he showed us the skin grafts from the, the repair of his arm from the accident. I couldn't believe it was just so just hanging. The skin was just sagging, but you know, it didn't affect how he played. Thank God. They were just getting ready to go back on, to go on tour as Rossington Collins. They were very pumped. He was very excited. He said that Saturday Night Live asked them to, if they wanted to come on the show. They were contemplating that. Um, I asked him if I could take a couple of pictures and he, he let me, I was not in any of the pictures. This is one of the ones that I took. Um, this is on Facebook, by the way, this is him in his couch sitting on his little, his chair. This is another close up one that I took. 
Cool. And then I took the group picture, which I regret not having jumped into. I should have jumped into that picture. But, you know, we were there. I, I asked him his birthday. He told me his birthday was July 19th. My birthday is July 14th. I was very happy. Um, you know, I, I remember he had he had a bunch of records on the floor. He had some gold albums in the room and he had an Eagles album on the border. So it was kind of cool to see that he listened to other, you know, what other music he listened to. But I had a photo album with me. It was a scrapbook that I had made and um, I have it with me actually, but he was looking through the album and I have an eight by 10 autograph, uh, um, sorry, eight by 10 picture of him in there. And I said, can you sign the picture? So he lifted up the magnetic film and he signed the picture. And this is what I have that'll always remember be precious to me. He put to Kathy, God bless you, Alan Collins. And um, we, I don't know how long we stay that day, but I was just thrilled. I was just thrilled to have met my idol. And I couldn't wait to get the film developed because I knew that it, I would have it captured forever. Gee, yeah. is this just jogging your memory any any of this? You remembering it? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Um as she tells the story, hope more comes back. And uh, I wish I could say I remember the whole thing, but that lick on the head I took in the plane crash, a lot of stuff just don't is gone and won't come back, you know. And when people talk about stuff and bring stuff up, then it it rings a bell, you know. But uh some of the stuff she's saying I can remember, but some of it I can't. Well, Kathy, you mentioned that Alan's arm was still messed up. I imagine, Gene, you probably had uh, some significant injuries still at that time. Uh, you know, uh, you had some let skin me, grafts. Let me, let me tell you about his arm. In the plane crash, a piece of metal had went into his arm and fractured his arm. And so when he came to Jacksonville, it they x-rayed it, looked at it, and it thought it was going to heal up. His arm never would heal up. And so to come to find out that there was a piece of aluminum between the two bones that would keep the bones from uh, grafting together. So they went in and uh, opened his arm up and took that piece of metal out and did a little work there. And um, he was in the hospital. And I knew, but I never did meet his uncle. Larkin's brother was a surgeon. I can't remember his name now. And so uh, they had Alan's arm hanging from a thing with a, a thing that keeps it drained. I can't think of uh, I can't think of the thing. It's the thing that keeps the infection out. So I went to see him the next day. And his arm was hanging there. I noticed his arm was big as a damn basketball. And I went, Alan, I said, man, something ain't right. He said, hemostat. So no, the hemostat, you know, when I said, something ain't right, man, something ain't right at all, you know? And so he went, you know, so I called his daddy. I said, Larkin, I said, Alan's arms don't look right. I said, it's, it's really big. He said, well, my brother's don't call. Let me call my brother and have him look at it. So I can't remember his uncle's name. I'm in the room with him and his brother, his uncle comes in. Immediately, he just looked and immediately called to get somebody to come get him taken to the OR immediately. What had happened is that hemostat had gotten stopped up and they hadn't checked it and the infection had got his arm was that big. So immediately he had to open up Alan's arm from his elbow to his wrist and it opened up about 10 inches. And he got the infection out and kept that out, you know, and got the infection out and had to do the graft because Alan's arm was full up so big that it wouldn't come back for a, for a while. So he had to graft skin in there. So he took skin off of Alan's left leg, where my, where my left leg, they took the graft off of my leg the same way and grafted that back to his arm. And so that night I wrote a poem to Alan about it and his daddy took the credit for it but I wrote that poem give it to him and so his uncle told me he said if you hadn't have called Larkin and he called me right then he said well, probably within three hours or so we'd had to cut his arm off because the blood circulation had been cut completely off in his arm so he said you saved that boy's arm 
and I told Ellen, I said, you owe me that arm, boy. And uh, that's, <laughs> that's the story. About, and after a while, it went down. And, you know, they did an operation to, t- to take some of the skin, excess skin off. But, Craig, you know this. If you look mm-hmm. years later at his arm, you'd see that big old skin graft there. And there still was some slack there. But he, he could play the guitar. All right, go ahead, Kathy, Craig. So, uh, hey, uh, Craig ha- happens to have a, a problem with his arm right now. <laughs> what, he's, okay. got, he's got a piece of metal in there. And Matter of fact, I don't have the Band-Aid on there. There's a hole in my arm right here. And I got a metal plate in here because I shattered this elbow and it won't heal. So I got to go get that plate taken out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that- yeah. It's just I think they're just going to do it in, in thing. The the doctor because I'm so old and my and my heart rate is only fifty eight because but the nurse said you must have been a, a pretty good athlete when you were young because your people with uh, like a fifty eight heart rate they're they're you know they have a healthy heart and the the other doctor that wants to do the surgery is kind of weird because you know seventy two seventy one year old men my age. Normally, they have heart problems, and somebody my age having a heart rate of 58 is kind of really unusual, but, you know, but, you know, I, I take care of myself, you know. I'm not fat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would say your heart rate is probably smoked up, to be honest with you. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know all the drugs and stuff, Gene, I did, and I was an alcoholic all those years. It's hard to believe that I'm as healthy as I am, you know. It's Greg, crazy. It's hard, to believe, it's hard to believe you alive, much less healthy. <laughs> Greg might have some blood in his THC, I think. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's got, that boy's got liquor running through his blood veins. <laughs> and not anymore. I haven't been an alcoholic for about a year. Well, it's been longer than that. Yeah, I quit, but... I, I quit like I quit a thousand times. Quitting's easy, but I, I quit a thousand times. But no, I finally <laughs> stuck with it. I drink a beer you, every now and you've then. Been sober for, you've been sober for about a year. That's not bad. One year out of 71, you know, that's that's pretty good average. <laughs> I drank a shot. I went out the other night. I drank a shot of Crown Royal, but just one. But You're then I did shot. some other stuff that made up for it. Whoa, wee. <laughs> I'm surprised the rigor and mortars don't sit right next to you, Greg. <laughs> hey, Kathy, we uh, we were talking about you know, your experience there with Alan, and uh, back to your story, didn't you? Um, didn't uh, uh, Rossington Collins come up to New Jersey or New York or something, and then you saw him again, or you didn't see Alan, but Gene was there? Tell us about that. Yeah, so I probably saw a dozen Rossington Collins concerts. I mean, I, w- I went to many of them, and Gene was kind enough to put us on the backstage list for several of them. So they played at the Garden State Arts Center, which is now the PNC Arts Center in Holmdale, New Jersey. And after the show, Gene, I met up with Gene, and he told us where they were staying, what hotel they were staying at. So my friend and I drove down there, and we met him outside, and he took us on the tour bus. And it was so funny. He gave us a couple of bottles of booze and he said, get the stuff out of here. I don't want them having all this booze. So he gave us a couple of bottles of vodka and we're like, okay, whatever. We took it. (laughs) And then he said to us, you know, would you girls like to come on and stay, you know, tonight we're going to be traveling down to, I think, Maryland or Delaware the next day. And we had the opportunity to travel with the band. And my cousin said, yes. And I said, I can't, I'm going to get in trouble. (laughs) I regret it. <laughs> I regret it. That was what? an opportunity. Who knows what would have happened, but that was a that was a great opportunity to see, you know, just hang out with the band and see who knows what would have happened, but we didn't do it. But Gene was so nice. And then he took us up to the room and you know, he took us up to his room. And again, he was such a gentleman. And then he took us to another room where everybody was partying. Gary was there. Uh, everybody was there and I had a baseball cap that I bought at the concert. This is it. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, everybody signed it. You know, it's interesting. The Henry Paul band played with them. And unfortunately I didn't have a Sharpie with me because a lot of the 
the signatures are fading, but Alan signed it. Um, everybody, Leon, Gary, Billy, everybody signed it. And um, it was fun, you know. I gave you 50 bucks for it. <laughs> the, this show at Homedale, well, was that was the was? Do you remember the? Well, I remember that show. It was crazy. They they ripped the th first three rows of uh, seats right out of the floor. Is that the same one? I don't think that was it. No, because I was there. I I had pretty good seats for that. Pretty people were pretty cool there. But um, yeah, I don't think that was the shutter. Calling that happened. Um, was but... it, maybe it was. Was that the second time we played there, or the first time? It was uh, 1981, I believe. I think it was 1981. I think it was maybe the second time. Man, I... there was one year. I don't remember if you remember, Gene. They ripped this thing first three rows. That they were. It was crazy during Freebird. <laughs> Everybody yeah. was standing on the the chairs and. And, and and it was crazy. People were up on stage, and we were we were out there. The roadies were out there trying to keep control of the whole thing. So I remember it was nuts, man. People were throwing uh, all kind of stuff on the stage. It was crazy. Home in New Jersey, that was it. Home deal had to be. I remember a little bit of that, Craig. Yeah, they were standing on the seats, and they first the three or four rows. They broke the seats loose. Yeah, 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 they broke. They, yeah, they did. It's crazy. Yeah. Craig, that was that, what. Isn't that the last place Alan played? Uh, what was that story? No, that was a Lone Star Cafe in New York City, nineteen eighty three. I guess. Yeah, we were. Yeah, uh, Jimmy Daltrey. Oh, I think isn't Jimmy Daltrey dead now? I think. I think is. so. Yeah. 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 If you're yeah, not you sorry, Jimmy, but I thought you're dead. <laughs> but uh but um no, he he let some guy that looked like Ronnie up on to sing. And uh Alan looked at him and went just put his guitar down, and went upstairs. And I went up there and I said, What the hell are you doing, Alan? He goes, It's 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 not right. I said, what do you mean it's not right? He is it's not right, and you of all people know it's not right. We're going home, and I mean he just walked off stage. You remember that, Gene? Yeah, I was oh, that was front. that was Alan Collins band. Yeah, I, I, I was Alan Collins band. I was up front selling my books and T-shirts. Oh and yeah, yeah, yeah. Big Lou came up to me and he went, "Look on stage, Gene," and I looked straight ahead. You know, but their band's playing. Uh, what's going on? He said, "Look up there. What do you see?" I said, "What's going on?" He said. Where's Alan Collins at? And I noticed that Alan was gone. And I said, watch, watch my stuff. And I went, you had, to, you had to walk across the stage and go up the stairs. I ran across the stage and went up the stairs and had put what little bit of airplane crash money I had left into the book. Alan asked me to publish that book, my book, and to get the Alan Collins band t-shirts. I could have his merchandise in business. So I run up those stairs. He's sitting there beside of a, a half of refrigerator, a small refrigerator. He was sitting in the refrigerator was to his left. I opened up the door and he's sitting there, you know. I said, what are you doing, boy? He said, it's all over, Gene. I, I just, I'm, I'm done. I went in the move, uh, in, in the mode to do a spinning roundhouse kick and knock his brains out. But just as I spun, I caught myself and I kicked the refrigerator, just crushed the door the refrigerator with, and he's, Gene, 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 man, Gene, Gene, sit down, man, Gene. It's, I'm Alan Collins. I said, I know who the fuck you are. He said, Jam, Gene, calm down, man. And, and, and I knew Alan. I said, uh, he said, I said, he said, I got you covered, man. I said, every damn penny I got's invested in this damn merchandise, your T-shirts, 2,500 Alan Collins band jerseys and T-shirts. He said, Gene, sit down, man. Let me tell you what's going on. I sit down beside him. He says. You remember last night? You just you just mentioned it. You remember last night when when Jimmy pulled a Ronnie Van Zandt look like on stage and sang "Sweet Home Alabama." I said, "Yeah, the guy did a good job." He said, "Well, Jimmy walked right back to the back of the stage and passed out cold." He said, "When he drinks a beer or two, he passes out. No matter where he's at, he passes out. He's not going to ruin my music. You know me, Gene." He said, "And anything will happen. We're going to go home. I'll get me another." singer 
And I guarantee you, this is Alan Collins telling you, I guarantee you, you'll get your money back. You got my word. I said, okay, buddy. He said, I want you to ride with me. Send your driver home. And we, we're, we're riding on the bus. And uh, he says, told the driver, he said, go to the Mer ER. I got to watch myself. Let's go to the ER. And I took him to, we went to the ER, went inside, and the doctor, ER doctor, said, what's going on, Alan? said, you know, told him that, you know, he'd lost his wife and this, that, and the other and everything, you know, he needed some, some medication. And the doctor, he was no BS doctor. He said, boy, he pointed, he said, boy, you a dope hit. You had, you're looking for some drugs and you ain't going to get them here. Get out of my ER. Alan said, I, listen, I, I'm having trouble with it. And the doctor said, I know what your problem is, boy. Get out of my ER. He said, you with him? I said, yes, sir. He said, take him away. And Alan stormed on out ahead of me. And the doctor looked at me. I looked at him and I went, you know, I, he knew. So we got back on the bus. And he said, man, I said, I understand what you're going through, Alan. I said, I know what the deal is. I said, uh, let's get home and get you straightened out. All right, man. He said, you're doing, doing a good job. Uh, helping us out. And he says, uh, you know my position. I said, yeah. He said, well, let's go home and then we'll start all over again. So we went home, got home. And so he had mentioned a couple of people and I'm not going to mention that guy's own name on this computer, but I told him, I said, he's, he'll sing for you. He's a good guy. He said, set me up an interview with him and we'll do a, um, what do you call it when somebody comes to to, to uh, audition? He said, I know him personally, Gene. He said, but I want to hear him sing. Okay, okay. So we set, I set up the interview for, I'll just say his first name, Sam. And so Sam was going to come down and, and sing a couple of Alan songs. Then he got paralyzed, you know, got in the car wreck. And uh, that ended it. And I happened to be in Larkin's office. When um, Craig, you would know the guy's name. I can't remember his name from MCA called Larkin and said, man, I really am sorry about Alan, you know, and everything. Tell us. Said, um, uh, it was uh, his it last was, name. Tell us. It wasn't until Leon. Tell us. Leon. No, tell it yeah. It was one of the from big, MCA. Big, one of the big guys, one of the big, big guys and told Larkin, he said, you know, that we can't put no money behind a guy <laughs> in a wheelchair. He said, but the album that, was doing great. We shipped 250000 to the East Coast. We were just going to let the album do what it's going to do because we can't put no money behind the body wheelchair. And Larkin said, I understand. No problem. And so um, he would have, Alan Collins' band would have been a super group if he just, if he hadn't got paralyzed. And he would have Well, got he was, uh, when Alan, well, you know, Gene, you know, when he was doing that album, he didn't spend a lot of time back there in that studio. Oh, he yeah. was, all messed up, man. Randall Hall and and Barry Harwood played most of that stuff on that album. And 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 I told Alan, I said he was shooting. He was. I don't know if everybody knows what Delatas are, but Alan was breaking down four Delatas at a time and shooting them up four times a day. You know, know. he was out of it and i said alan you're gonna get out there on the road and you're gonna have no drug what are you gonna you know and he you know he was out of it man he was in no condition to do anything you know i don't know what he was telling you about going home and getting somebody else but he was out of it man he, he was, was he him. was you know that was a bad thing and that went on for quite a while you know it if it was uh, Randall that. Hall and Barry Harwood and, and Derek Hess and, and then Leon, they, you know, but that was a great album. It was, it was, a you know, that was a great, I mean, it was a great band. Rossington Collins was a great band. Yeah, the MCA guy said the Alan Collins band album was the best album since Street Survivors. But when Kathy died, Craig, you know that he just didn't have no respect for himself. He just no. didn't care about He that was on a mission to, to destroy himself for some reason. It was And uh, I take just, some of that I take some of that blame because in seventy five when Ronnie came to me and said, Hey, Alan can't go to jail for ten days, 
the uh, he lost his license, driver's license, in 1975 for life. He could never ever get another driver's license. And I so, drove him around. Yeah, yeah, being a union, you know, and I'm not going to say anything on here about um, what goes on in uh, uh, port cities and places, but you know that you can if you got the cash money and know the right lawyer the judge the right judge the lawyer can take care of stuff get stuff yeah done. we both uh, know what happened back there with his lawyer and then oh, all that went down when he killed that girl and that was oh, yeah. a bad situation yeah oh yeah i see to ken i'm not gonna mention his name ken come to me and he yeah, said, yeah 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 hey, hey gene he said look here man he said Alan's got to go to jail for 10 days. He has to go to jail to take the pressure off for us. I'm not going to say who us is on this thing, but he said, you got to, you got to go talk to him, convince him. He has to go to jail for 10 days. I've got it worked out. He can go to jail on Friday night, wash police cars, Saturday and Sunday, go home Sunday night, come back next Friday night and do this for 10 days. And that'll take the pressure off of us. Um, the, you know, the people. Yeah, I know and, who you're talking and, about. And I told was my attorney, I, too. <laughs> I, I, bingo. I went out and told him, <laughs> you have to do it to take the pressure off for certain people. Said, okay, I'll do it, man. And so, you know, he went to jail and watched police cars on the weekend and met that girl, you know. And so I'm not going to get into that either on this computer. But um, that was his downfall. And uh, uh, his money, knowing the right People kept him afloat, kept him. He could do what he wanted to. He could, you know, oh, yeah. and I told it him did. right before, right before he, I said, he no, had I, connections. That's for sure. I, I had connections. And I told him, <laughs> so I told him, I said, everything you're doing, do you, uh, do you, uh, do you uh, it's all, that's all misdemeanor stuff. If you ever hurt anybody or kill anybody, then the stakes change. And so, y'all don't worry, man. I got it. Y'all got plenty of money. I said, just understand me, you know. And so, when they when they killed the girl, when the girl got killed, that was no misdemeanor. That couldn't be washed under the rug so easy. And even though the big people could take care of stuff, you can only go so far with uh, other people's. Your money can only go so far with other people's establishment. You know what I mean? I'm not going to get into that, but that. Uh, that spoiled him, you know, because he could do what he wanted to do. And you know, right before he, the girl got killed in that wreck, was it a couple of days before he totaled out the other Thunderbird and went down and got another Thunderbird? Well, yeah, that, and Kathy has that picture of the uh, the Burgundy Tornado that yeah. she saw Alan coming in. And, and I didn't remember that car because I he bought the white one and then he ended up giving to me, giving it to me because I'm the only one that ever drove it. But he gave yeah. me the white one. But yeah. after I seen the picture of the Burgundy, or I, when I remember that, did he wreck that car? I think so. And I tried yeah, to... Yeah, he must have. I took a pencil, piece of paper, and tried to estimate... <laughs> the, the the value of automobiles and you know all of the mercedes benz all of those cars he totaled out tore up flipped over turned upside down he didn't get hurt he only he only got the injuries and then the girl being killed in the ford so you're gonna try I to kill yourself, do it in the mercedes benz don't go in the ford i don't remember remember the first mercedes he bought for kathy the station wagon yeah the station I don't wagon. remember because he had the the black lincoln he wrecked that yeah and then and then i don't remember him wrecking kathy's car the, the i don't the, think he wrecked the, the kathy's mercedes station business. wagon but his remember that black super that, that one expensive one the, that 380 SEL, yeah, I drove that thing 135 miles an hour. Yeah, that's the one that's on the, Highway 17 there where the lady ran yeah. the red light and went through. The, the 450 SEL, he, I was in the passenger seat when he flipped that thing over and over end one night. And then we both you. went to jail. But, hey, Griff, Griff, we got some pretty good questions I think yeah. we should kind yeah, of let's cover. Let's get back. Let's let Kathy say some more because this is her gig. And Kathy, we're, not to, we're, not to, we're not trying to cut you out, Kathy. <laughs> no, it's okay. Kathy, do, do, do you wish you to jump in the car with Alan and take an ride? No, no. Uh, in retrospect, I wish I had accepted the offer to 
travel overnight with them. That would have been fun. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Hold on, Kathy and Griff. Craig, can you count how many times you, how many times that he in the car you was in or he was in with somebody else? He just grabbed the wheel and flipped the car over. How oh, many times? All the time. He did it with me all the time. Oh, in, in Atlanta it, doing that that oh, all the time. Oh, I mean, I, and then he, he'd reach over and step, put his foot on your on on your foot on the gas pedal, and he wouldn't, and, and he wouldn't let up, and you'd have to hit the brake. To, uh, it was crazy. Yeah, right before we left to go on the the of the, uh, the tour, I had bought me a new Volkswagen Rabbit, and then after the crash, and I got out of the hospital uh, thirty days or a month later, and I I, I was so messed up, I didn't want to keep that Volkswagen, so I traded the Volkswagen in on a brand new Cutlass Supreme. I took it out to Allen to show Allen my new Cutlass Supreme, you know, and so so we get some beer. So he's sitting over there, you know, I'm driving down and he, Gene Odom ain't no fool, son. Don't you <laughs> never think Gene Odom the fool. I was driving with him and he reaches and grabs the steering wheel and tried to turn my car over. And I locked my left hand down and I elbowed him upside the head so fast. He, he, <laughs> went, he went, damn, you're pretty fast. You're pretty sharp. I said, listen, boy, don't you dare ever try that with my, in me in the car. I will hurt you. He said, all right. You know, he had a big old red place on his side of face. He would have flipped my car over. And I, I, I said, you won't never do that with Gene Odom driving. So go ahead, Chris. <laughs> yeah, okay. We got some questions. And it sounds like uh, some of them have already been answered. Um one of them was uh, from Kathy Keeble to Kathy Godsey, uh, and sh she was asking, how old were you when you met Alan? I don't know if you mentioned that. Um, uh, yeah, I was 18, almost 19 in 1980. Yeah, and then she mentioned um, uh, what stood out to you in that meeting with him as far as meeting with him. What, what was the, the one thing that stood out that you could say? Just seeing him in col up, you know, in person, and seeing how tall and thin he was, and in his own environment, and sitting in a chair as opposed to always standing playing a guitar, you know, um, just talking to him and having a conversation directly with him is really something that I will always remember. And then uh, a Sherry Padula asked. Um, Thank you for sharing your story. She mentions that. One thing I keep hearing is how down to earth the guys were. Were you intimidated by meeting Alan at all? Absolutely not. I was thrilled. Yeah, <laughs> I could have stayed all day. Could have stayed. Oh, Did definitely. He... he was very just chill. He was just, you know, you know, meeting him, I it, it wasn't like meeting a rock star. He was just very chill relaxed and his kids were playing and one of his friends was there the woman the other woman in the picture was there with her little boy nothing he just there was no aura of rock star at all there it was just very down to earth craig it was tal and his wife and their child remember tal? oh yeah oh yeah that, that tal was, yeah I'm yeah tal's, de tal's dead tal's dead too yeah, he's all, all, all of those people are dead. All those people are dead, son. I'm telling you. you know? <laughs> yeah, and then another uh, thing Sherry uh, Padula asked was, uh, did he try to shoot you with a BB gun? Because he... he, 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 he. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he was on very good behavior. You know, his wife was there. She was walking around. And it was just like a family thing. There's nothing crazy going on. He was just hanging out. <laughs> So Listen, now, Craig, I wonder where you were, Craig. It was probably in the it, it's hard to car. tell. <laughs> Craig, I don't know if you remember this, but I went over there one day, you know. Craig and Craig and Alan Collins were very, very close. I mean, they were close. And so Craig was over there quite a bit, you know. And so I happened to be there for something. Alan's sitting on the couch, and Craig Reed is standing by the <laughs> Craig, you remember that I hope by the Ellen had a glass sliding doors that went out to the porch out to the pool area. And I swear on Ronnie Van Zandt's grave, this happened. Craig standing there, you know, I'm looking at him, and he had opened the door and he slid the door back. And a mosquito bit Craig on the shoulder. 
and I was going to, I'm looking at the mosquito going crazy, and that mosquito, you could, I could hear his wings. That mosquito went, <laughs> bam, flew right into that glass line door and fell down. That way, mosquito was stoned out of his mind. <laughs> you remember that, correct? <laughs> Funniest thing I ever seen. That mosquito, you, you could hear it, <laughs> bam, right into the glass. Funniest thing I ever seen. <laughs> I believe it. I, 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 listen, that's a true story, son. But uh, it was a it was a fried mosquito. He bit the wrong oh guy. If he bit me, he'd been okay. But he bit Craig. I heard a lot of Gene Odom stories, and that that one that's a that's a good one right there. That's probably the best story I've ever it's heard. It's as true as I am. I promise you. Okay, okay. <laughs> we got a question for you from. Uh, a Chris, a Chris Waldron uh, asked, uh, hey, Gene, where do you think life would have taken you had you never met Ronnie all those years ago? Oh, well, that's a good one, huh, Gene? <laughs> yeah. Uh, be honest with you, buddy, it ain't went far since then either, you know what I mean? But, uh, uh, well, I mean, it, that's my claim to fame, was knowing Ronnie and working with working with the band and the and Ronnie got me the job with the Rolling Stones in 75 and um, working with Ronnie, uh, being his friend, uh, being a real true and dear friend as he was to me and I was to him. Um, I'd have been, I was an iron worker. I'd have probably kept on iron working. You know, I went back to iron working in 1980 until I fell in 1990 and got all broke up. You know, uh, I'd have probably been, I'd, I'd probably be Gene Odom just like I am today, you know, if I haven't had, no, if it had been the airplane crash, I'd have probably stayed married to my first wife, and you know, I can't, you can't look, you can't look back, you can't, you know, um, I would be basically the same guy, you know, I have two eyes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and wouldn't have been almost, up, it wouldn't be broke, but, uh, I would have, you know, you'd have I mean, a workers pension, that's for sure. Yeah, two hundred seventy-seven dollars a month. The Mexicans crossing that damn river down there get two or three thousand dollars a month. I get two hundred seventy-seven. Yeah. yeah. If you that's went not, to college, that's you get ten thousand. That's not two thousand. That's not two thousand seventy-seven. That's two hundred and seventy-seven. <laughs> and when I got my social security in, in uh, nineteen ninety, uh, got my social security. I was divorced. My children were grown. So I only got the 40-year-old single pension. It was $900 a month. I got screwed the whole way around, you know. But with my, it's Gene Odom luck. I just laugh about it. Just keep on trucking. <laughs> yeah, one thing yeah. I have to say about Gene, he does keep on trucking, and you can't hit a moving target with Gene. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We got uh, Joey Edwards. Joey Edwards, he's a real cool guy. He's always got some great questions and a great Skinner fan. Did Gene and Ronnie ever get into a fist fight? No. No, when you, you know, I never did no drugs or alcohol or nothing like that. And I was always cool headed. And uh, no, Ronnie Van Zandt was a scrapper, but no, never, never even, never even came. Well, his dog, he, Craig, you remember Tiny? Oh, Ronnie, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It nip you on the leg, you know. And, uh, <laughs> that dog bit me on the. It nipped me on the foot, you know. And I, I said, I'm, I said, I'm, I'll pinch your head off, Ronnie. Went, you mess with my dog, where you be fighting? That's the closest <laughs> we ever. That's the closest we ever come. Back. We were laughing, both laughing about it because he knew that little dog nipped on the leg. But no, never. <laughs> I would never ever 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 come a reason for that. No, go ahead. Well, Gene, weren't you guys kind of like, I mean, you met him when you were real young, you know, you guys were like little kids, and kids, yeah. weren't you guys kind of like bullies in the neighborhood, the both of you? Uh, not bullies. It was more your brother, Red, wasn't it? Red was the, didn't you have a Red, brother, Red, Red Odom? Richard, and Red, by the time Skinner got going, Red was in the, in the federal penitentiary. Richard well, didn't Red. wasn't it Rayford written about Red, your brother Red? Yeah, Ronnie four and walls Red. of Rayford. That was about Red, wasn't it? Yeah, Red, Ronnie, and Jeff Carlisi. They went that Ronnie said Jeff down there and bought a flat top, 
and Jeff Carlisi and Ronnie wrote the song Four Walls Rafer on that flat top. Ronnie yeah. gave me the guitar. Ronnie gave me the guitar. When my brother got out of uh, Fort Leavenworth, I gave him the guitar <laughs> and a and a, a signed album, the whole band signed for him, you know. But yeah, that was about my brother. Four Walls of Rape. <laughs> well, we got you on here. You know, it, it's it's really great to have Gene Odom on here because I mean he's talking about history with Ronnie Van Zant and all those guys in the band. What were some of the great. things? Don't leave Craig out now, cause Craig got a whole oh, yeah. lot of history. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah, but I came in after <laughs> after they did their first record. He's talking about actually yeah, growing them up with yeah, those guys. Really a lot of people want to know, you know, about the racetrack. You guys, yeah. you and Ronnie at the racetrack, yeah, sitting was... in the trees watching the racing, and and Ronnie wanted to be a race car driver too. Well, we grew up with the famous race. NASCAR driver Leroy Yarber, no kin, kin to uh, Kale Yarber. And Leroy was probably three to five years older than us. And he started out right down Orton Street. They just tore his garage down that he started his first racing career at. And they're building them damn door, uh, Section 8 housing down there. But we, we, Leroy at Old Speedway Park would run high in the trees or run across the track. And Leroy got his start there. And then he went, I went and I got drafted in 69. And so Leroy had went up to North Carolina, started racing for a guy named Larry Shankle. Larry Shankle happened to be Marty Robbins' mechanic. And Larry got a car and started, uh, Leroy started driving for him. Then Leroy uh, started driving for uh, Junior Johnson, somebody before that. And so this is a hell of a story. Now y'all pay attention. <laughs> I was I was overseas in the army, and so only two people have ever won NASCAR's triple crown. I think David Pearson and Leroy Yarber is the only two that's ever won it. Leroy won the triple crown in '69. I was overseas in the army, and so um, I think the Daytona 500 paid 100000 back then. Now it pays a couple million. So Leroy, West Side Boy, fight like hell, mean as hell, but a fantastic race car driver. At the time, the best. And so um, he got 100000 And so he took his, you women don't pay attention to this, you wives. He <laughs> took his whole crew. Uh, all through the cat houses up there in uh, North Carolina, around Charlotte, all the cat houses, party, 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 and they have a good time. So Leroy and his wife, they went camping. And so by, by our camping, and Leroy got bit by a tick, and he didn't pay no attention to it. And so he was also racing Indianapolis. And so, and his worst track, because Leroy Yarber, they get more damn old glue, sticky tires. They got to glue you down to the track now. Not back when Leroy Yarber. Leroy Yarber either won the race or lost it. They wasn't no in between. He was wide open, and he was right there with Earnhardt and Richard Petty. He was the man to beat. He won it or lost. It. And Darlington, if you don't know anything about Darlington, a lot you hit the walls a lot back then because you didn't have them more glue down sticky tires like the sissies have got today. And so. Um, he hit the wall several times and, and banged his head up. They didn't know didn't anything. And so he went to um, Indianapolis, 200 miles an hour, and hit the wall and wrecked the car, tore it over, banged him up. They put a plate in his head. So he kept, after that, wrecking the cars, re wrecking. And it, then he got, he couldn't find, it's hard for him to find a, 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 a company to drive for. Junior Johnson spent $250,000 taking Leroy Yarber to clinic hospitals around trying to find out what was wrong with him. They couldn't find out what was wrong with him. So Junior Johnson, they finally figured out what was wrong. When the tick bit him, it gave him Rocky Mountain spotted fever and they misdiagnosed him all them years and it drove him completely insane. And he was put into McClenny in the mental institution. After that, it was 19, I think 1984. I was driving down Mull Street 
just going through our old neighborhood in the ditch. And I passed, I went, damn, that looked like Leroy. And I backed back up. It was Leroy Yarber in the damn ditch picking up Coke bottles and beer cans. And I said, Leroy, it's Gene Odom. He went, the first thing that man out of his mouth was, Gene, I'm sorry about our old buddy Ronnie. And I said, Lee, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to get me some damn drinking money. Genie said, I think my social security check is out. And so I pulled out a $20 bill. And I said, hey, that's too much. So I gave him $5. I said, get yourself. I think he threw them damn beer cans out of his pocket and coat bottles and he hauled ass down to Claude's, the little store that was built after Claude's, closed down the Claude store, the old Curtis little store at Plymouth. And so right after that, I found out from somebody real close. He got in an argument with his mama. One of them would get their social security check before the other one. And Leroy was not right. And he was arguing about some money and his nephew came in and jumped on Leroy. Leroy beat the piss out of him. and They sent him back to the institution and he died there. But in 1965, I'm going to tell you all the story. And this is documented. Some magazine you can read it or you can find out from people that know. 1965, Chrysler sent Leroy Yarber, and I'm not sure if Ray Fox, a 1965 Dodge Coronet 426 Hemi to make that race car out of. Leroy and, and, and Ray built a handmade blower for that 426 Hemi. Daytona International Speedway. In 1965 or 66, they had it ready for the track. They went to Daytona. They, Leroy warmed it up and he ran around the track and opened it up wide open from first in the first turn into the second turn. When he floored it, he started smoking the tires and they thought he blowed the engine, so they threw the caution lights on. He coasted from halfway around that track across the finish line. When he crossed the finish line, he was still doing 140 miles an hour. They estimated him doing 100, over 180 in 1965 on them street tires they had in 1965. If he'd have had them damn sticky tires they got today, he'd have been running 275 miles an hour on Daytona. <laughs> That's a true story. Y'all can look what? that up. Did Boy, Ronnie want to be a race car driver, though? And there's he, he, rumor, he about, there rumors yeah. that Ronnie wanted to be a race car driver, and then he wanted to be a boxer. Did he? Did he kind of have a little difficulty in the boxing ring, boxing? Because he's kind of a street <laughs> fighter. I think he got his ass kicked, didn't he? Let, me, let me tell you the story about that. So back <laughs> then, back then, early on, we both liked Cassius Clay. You know who that was. Yeah. Cassius. yeah. Oh, yeah. We watched it. Ronnie loved him. Ronnie loved Cassius. Clay. <laughs> I, know, I think we all did. Some of, for all you people that don't know who Cassius Clay was, he later on changed his name to Muhammad Ali. But so Ronnie, you know, oh, oh, before that, let's go back before that. Um, well, wait a minute. Let me see. I might not be in right order, but it's okay. Yes. He, he, uh, wanted to be a boxer and so I think Lacey got a pair of boxing gloves and so I was picking up coke bottles I didn't have no time for that horse play and so Ronnie the first one he wanted to box was Estes Godwin Estes Godwin was uh, about three years older than us a little bit shorter than Ronnie but real stocky a bit a real mean boy at that age and at that time back then so he would Ronnie says hey yeah come on Estes that's this guy when beat the tar out of Ron. I mean, punched him up, made him punch drunk. And so that changed Ronnie's plans about wanting to be a boxer because he got his ass whipped the first time in the ring. <laughs> so at Lake Shore, I mean, not Lake Shore, at Robert E. Lee High School, Ronnie went there right about the same time as Coach Leonard Skinner got there. Ronnie left because he got Nadine pregnant, but Coach Leonard Skinner came in and took over. Ronnie left about the time Coach got there. But anyway, Ronnie made the football team. So then he wanted to be a running back. He loved the Green Bay Packers. So he made the team from the first practice scrimmage, the very first practice that he was involved in, 
He got the ball, got tackled, and broke his ankle all to hell, and they had to put a pin in it. So by putting a pin in his ankle, that made him 4F, so he couldn't be drafted in the, in the Army. You say he, he couldn't be drafted. He was 4F. And all the rest of us on suckers was a 4A. And so uh, after he healed up from that, I'm pretty sure it, I was I was working for a living at, when I was five years old. But anyway, um, his good buddy, really, really good buddy, Bill Fares, Jim Daniel, the Stones were coming, I think it was 1964, to the stadium in, in Gator Bowl in Jacksonville. So Ronnie and Bill and Jim went down there to watch the Stones. And back then, satisfaction and Mick Jagger dancing on stage. Ronnie, Ronnie came back, you know, shuffling, sitting around going, hey, man, I'm going to be a singer. I want to get me a band. So <laughs> there's how the story changed right there. That's He found his he found his calling. And it, it, was, it, it wasn't dancing on stage, but it was on stage singing. That was his calling. He went to the... Uh, some guys, I can't think of the name of them, um, Rick Doshler and uh, the, the Artigan guys. With Artiga is the rich side of Jacksonville. And we was on the poor side. It's, there's a difference between the rich side and the poor side. And Ronnie walked in there and said, they were looking for a singer. Ronnie walked in and, you know, nobody wanted to mess with Ronnie because he was mean as hell anyway. I want to be your new singer, you know. So, <laughs> Come on, try out. You know, you can sing. So, <laughs> I don't think I don't think Ronnie liked that kind of uh, 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 ambiance, if that's the right word. <laughs> and so he's he's gonna put his own band together, you know. And he uh, he did. He put his band together along with Gary, you know. And I can't remember how what the order was, but um, I think it was Ronnie Gary, who Larry Johnston, you know. And uh, Bob Burns, Bob was it with, with them yet? They were trying to put, the, you know, the play put it together. Well, that was excuse me, Gene, but that was that was the same time when Ronnie wanted to be a baseball player too, right there. When that's kind of how all they all got together, right there, were in the baseball field. So Ronnie, Ronnie went from from uh, baseball to <laughs> to race car driver to boxer, or and and. and all in, a short, all in a short while. Yeah, we, we played ball down at the Criswell Field and at Hyde, Hyde Park Elementary School that we went to. And it was, there was the city leagues too, you know. And uh, I can't remember if Gary played for the Green Pigs or the uh, the Green Pigs, Mock Sox. One of them played, Ronnie played for the Mock Sox or Gary did, or Ronnie played for the Green Pigs or Gary did. And I played for the Optimus, Jacksonville Optimus team. But yeah, that and we were kids riding bicycles, you know. And uh, so when Ronnie started putting that band together, uh, band together, it, he got this. He got his Lacey and sister bought him up. He was bagging groceries down with Sam DeFranco at Pantry Proud on Normandy Boulevard. He was fifteen years old, and he's bagging. Was this groceries. during the Noble Five? The, yeah, and they, when he, when they first put the band together for the first name. Now, Craig, I probably can't remember all the names that they started. I think the first one they started with was My Backyard. My Backyard, yeah, that's what yeah, I heard. Yeah, and then Conquer the Worm. <laughs> uh, My Backyard, Conquer the Worm. Uh, the Pretty Ones, 1%, and then Leonard Skinner. I think that's how it went. Yeah. Conquer man. the Worm, you know. Debbie, you know what? I mean, not Debbie, but <laughs> Kathy, you know what? Talk what worm are we talking about? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just take a guess with that one. <laughs> well, what, what what cover songs did they play? Play, Gene? You, you, the worm and the tequila bottle. Go ahead, Craig. Oh, um, yeah. Well, um, what what cover songs? I I had heard somebody say they played some Led Zeppelin cover songs in in bars and stuff, and I Beatles, I didn't know they they the ever Beatles, played the Beatles. Uh, they played several several bands at the time that were on the radio, and the one that stands out the most to me, watching Ronnie Van Zandt sing, it was "Wooly Bully" by Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. <laughs> you ain't never seen Ronnie Van Zandt sing nothing until you hear him sing "Wooly Bully" by 
Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. <laughs> hey Gene, when you were when you were hanging around with Ronnie when you guys were like riding your bicycles around and stuff, did you ever notice any kind of talent like with his writing abilities and things like that? Because he I heard he liked to write poems. So <clears throat> he, he a, a couple of times, yeah, but what I remember most about him in his in his aura about what what, what he went from where he went to was um, he, he was always good with simple words but in this brother's in-law's auto parts store I was amazed at how he knew the part numbers on thousands of damn parts and wouldn't have to look into the part book. There wasn't no computers back then. There were just these massive big old books that you had to flip through to look up the parts of the card or whatever, you know, and uh, I would have to do that, but he didn't. He could, you know, but back then the parts were so much simpler and they're not all of that's jive today. And, you know, somebody come in and ask for something, he'd go, hey, Gene, grab this. I'd say, man, look it up. Just go grab that, you know, grab P1450, whatever. And Man, damn, okay, I'd go back there and get the right part, I'd bring it back. It was the right part, you know. I and mean, a couple times she's got kind of irritated, you know. And I'm like, Man, look in the book, check it out. I don't want to just go get the damn part. I know what it is, you know. <laughs> he was a, I guess he would say he had a photograph memory. I'm not sure if that's right, but he was a, the comical Craig, Craig would know this better than me at the Hale House and other places, you know, and with, with people sitting down and writing. He didn't share his writing with everybody he only shared that writing with, oh, a, yeah. with a, a, a select few of people and you know it was uh, either him or, him or gary and alan you know when i was always around it was her. whoever he I, I don't know i guess it was whoever he thought would be the best put the best music to the words he wanted to hear i don't know that would only be you know I, be my a a select few, believe me, a very select. Yeah, few. yeah, but it was always him and him and Gary and Alan always wrote. Sometimes, you know, there Ed, you know, there's some, you know, but oh yeah, yeah, he would, you know, you know, he would call one or the other to his room and say, "Here, um, I, I don't know why he would choose them like that, but you know, I know, I think Alan was on the most on most Bingo. of his songs. Bingo. Alan yeah. Cummins was the sound of Leonard Skinner. Without Alan Cummins, you can never, ever achieve the sound of Leonard Skinner. Never. You know that. And nobody after Alan Collins has ever achieved the sound that Alan Collins brought to that. And, you know, um, it was Randall Hall re rehearsing for uh, um, 87 for the uh, tribute, tribute tour. And when Alan called me to come pick him up, and so I took him over there. If I hadn't seen this with my own eyes and had been in the vehicle with him, I would have never, ever believed it. He called me and says, hey, Gene, come pick me up. I got over there. You know, he had that big old black, big old black, like a rescue thing that his uh, um, van, uh, Iveco, that, and it was a big, big, huge, like a huge rescue unit type uh a uh, 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 camper that he had uh, for his wheelchair. So I got him in it, got him in it, you know, stepped him in between, right by the driver's seat. And we, hold on a second. We were driving him back over to Jacobs, you know, and there's a four lane road with a turn lane there and that big muffler shop right there and the office behind it. And we had just built uh, that soundproof recording studio in the back. So I pulled up into the lane to turn left, 250 feet from the studio. And I'm waiting for the traffic to come by. And the, the AC's on. And he said, listen to that shit. I said, well, I thought something was <laughs> wrong. I thought something was wrong in his van. He said, listen to that shit, Gene. I said, what? Man, what's wrong? Something wrong with the van? What's wrong with the van? The windows are up in this van. And the AC's on. He said, no, man. I said, what's the matter? He said, Gary's playing the wrong notes. I went, you can hear that from here? I said, hell yeah, that's my music. This is inside a recording studio with double wooden doors and everything, 250 feet away outside. 
I pull up, get in front of the place, pull up there, get him out, get him in a wheelchair, and get him up the steps, get him in there. I'll never forget this, Craig Reed. I'll never, ever forget this. Alan, I, I opened up the double wooden doors, yeah. pushed him inside, and he went, stop, stop. Ed King, I asked Ed later on about this. Ed King turned his back to Alan. And Gary was like, Gary, what's going on? Alan says, you're playing the wrong notes. Gary went, I wrote this music. Alan Collins said, I changed it. You're playing the wrong notes. I'm still got a hold of his wheelchair. Gary said, Alan Collins says, uh, I, don't, I can't remember what song it was. Alan says, hit it. So Gary starts playing and Alan says, stop. Alan could, Craig, you knew Alan could still use his arms. Alan reached over and told and said, Gary, put that finger there. Put this finger here. Put that finger here. Hit it. Then I stop. He said, all right, put that finger here. Put that finger here. Put that finger here. Hit it. Stop. But I watched Alan do that for four times. <laughs> and I went into Larkin's office. I said, Alan, I'll go into Larkin's office and sit and talk with Larkin. So he was back there for some time. And so he, he eventually hollered for me. So come back and said, take me home. I was like, I got it again. And, he, and he, as he turned, as I got him in the wheelchair, he says, you're going to play it right. You ain't going out and play my music like that. So I got him out the door, got him down the steps. And first thing he said, Greg, stop at the Florida National Bank on San Juan. I need to get some money. So I pulled up to the had ATM machine then. The ATM machine, and he gave me his ATM card. I got some money. I don't know how much it was. Handed it to him. He took most of the money, and he gave me some. He says, take me home. You take this money, and you go buy the wood that it takes to build a ramp out in front of this from my wheelchair. He says, I'm going to be here every day till they get it right. So I took him home, and I ran back, and I built a ramp. The next day, I picked him up, brought him back to the studio, and uh, Larkin Collins says, hey, Gene, you go back to work. I'll, I'll pick him up, take care of this. Okay, so and he stayed there for I don't know how long watching them rehearse. And uh, I asked Ed King later on, I said, well, when Alan came in there and said, hold on, why would you turn your back? He said, well, Gene, I, don't, I thought he was just drugged out. I didn't know what the problem was going to be. He's, uh, and, but he, he, when he come back in and when I seen what he was doing, I knew what he was doing because Gary Rosington was playing the wrong notes. Alan Collins made that music and he made them notes. I saw that with my own eyes. Go ahead, Craig. Hey, uh, Gene. Um, hey. We, you know, a lot. I, I've heard a lot of these these stories you've told me I, hanging around with you. And I think one of the one of the greatest things I ever did was go on that West Side tour with you. And uh, yeah. because people don't realize when you're riding around on the West side with Gene and you see all these places where the guys grew up and uh, just like Kathy said, she went out to the uh, cemetery where, where Ronnie was buried and, and then uh, Gene takes you over the ball field and to the school. And the whole time you're riding around, Gene's got stories just like this. So if anybody's interested uh, in, in doing that West side tour, Gene, Gene, how would they get a hold of you? Uh, um, uh, hanging with Gene? Yeah, hanging with Gene. Hanging with Gene Odom dot com. Or Patty, Patty set that up for me. Hanging with Gene Odom. Yeah, I think it's hanging with Gene Odom. Hanging call, with Gene Odom dot com. Kathy, right? in touch with me. Huh? Hanging with Gene Odom dot com. Is that what it is? I, I think so. Hanging. There's with an Gene. email on there. Yeah, yeah, so if anybody's interested with that, yeah, because Gene still does those tours and it's and it's and it's pretty awesome. But uh we we want to get you back on here, Gene. We're running out of time. We're about we're over an hour. I told you it'd go by fast. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't want to be a hog, but we need to get more get get Kathy on more yeah. Kathy on here. <laughs> Kathy, we appreciate you coming on and you know um, and talking about that story. Uh about uh alan and then you know that that spurred off a lot of good stories gene talking about it and and gene uh we got him to go down there at the panera there and sit there and i i know it's uncomfortable for you gene because because those seats are kind of rough gene's back isn't like it used to be from that airplane crash but craig you about ready to wrap it up 
I think so. Yeah. Yeah. One thing um, about this whole this whole thing is, as long as it takes to uh, record it, it takes just as long to download it into the software and edit it and all of that. So if we don't stop it now, we'll be up till midnight. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Griff and Craig, I appreciate this opportunity. We'll have to do it again. Kathy? Yes. Anytime. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a pleasure for me. And it's so nice to see you again, Gene. Well, thank you. And uh, get back with Griff. Maybe we'll do something, you know, some other, you know, talk some other time or something. Craig? I would love get, that. Yeah. Certainly. All right, Craig, you ready? All right. That was uh, number 28 of the Stone Roadie Show with Kathy. <laughs> Godzy, goodzy, godzy. When <laughs> <laughs> you get through with it, Chris. Kathy Godzy, our friend Kathy Godzy, and the infamous Gene Odom, alive, alive, a living and a breathing. And we're going to call that one the Stone Roadies Show number 28. And that's a wrap. We'll see you next time. <laughs>